Okay, welcome to another episode of A Beer with Atlas. I'm Rich. I'm Brian. And this week, uh, I'm having a little deja vu, but we're going to we'll push through it, I think. Yeah, just 33%. Uh, maybe, maybe just a little bit. So, uh, Grand Teton Brewing Company out of, uh, where was this? Where was this? I wrote this down. This is in, it's, it's in, in Idaho. Idaho. Yeah, it's in Idaho, just at the foot of the Teton Mountains. Uh, Victor, Idaho. So, uh, you have been to this brewery, I yes? I have, yes. Yeah, I can't wait to talk about this because it sounds, it sounds beautiful. Cool, yeah, it is, so, for sure. We have three different beers we're going to try from them. Uh, one of our recruiters, uh, no, I'm sorry, one of our client managers brought us these beers. Uh, yes. Taylor Christensen, who has some, uh, his family owns some land out there, apparently has owned it for years and years, and they, they frequent this part of Idaho. I would if I could. I would too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So we've got three different kinds, three different styles this time. One style that, have we done a Goza before? Um, I feel like we might have, but maybe we might have talked about it, mm-hmm. kind of dancing around some other sour beers okay. or Berliner Vices. So, so they have it's a, possible. a grapefruit Goza, which is a, is a sour-ish style. Uh, we have a Session Ale. I hope we talk about this because I don't know what a Session Ale is. Yeah. And then we have this, their standard IPA. Okay. Oh, called the Teton Range IPA. I uh, I like IPAs. Yes, I know you do. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Just I was just stating a fact there. Which one do you want to start with? Uh, let's start with um, let's start with the IPA, okay. just because uh, the Goza can get warm a little bit. That's okay, and okay. The, we'll power through the. The session ale. All right. So, uh, anticipating that you're going to talk about what a session ale is, I'll go into the history of the yeah, go of for the it. brewery a little bit here. Throw me your uh, throw me your glass. There we go. Uh oh. Uh oh. Look at that. Man, I got to get. Man, you're a rough pour. I got to get better at pouring. Slow look down. at you. Here goes yours too. Oh goodness. Look at that thing. I'm gonna let that settle down there a little bit. So simmer down now, as they say. Yep. Okay. Founded in 1988 by Charlie and Ernie Otto, it started. The brewery started off as the Otto Brothers Brewing Company. Um, they were the first microbrewery in Wyoming. So, uh, as much as they're in Idaho now, they started in in Wyoming. Um, did a lot for the state of Wyoming to get microbreweries up and going and being able to bring in other uh, non macro breweries is that what you call them yeah macro yeah yep so get get the kind of micro brew scene started there in in wyoming in 1989 they discovered a long forgotten and this is a little bit of a little bit of uh, fun okay if you didn't know this i'm gonna be so excited that i found this out all right so uh they discovered a long forgotten european lidded lidded okay pale with a lid on it lidded pale known as a growler yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So they reintroduced it in a 64 ounce bottle with a resealable top. Okay. And that became the modern day growler. Like for everybody? For everybody. So they are credited with the glass growlers. Yes. We have today. Wow. Yes. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Man, that is awesome. That's like Craft Beer Hall of Fame trivia stuff right there i think i might have just graduated to like the next level of craft beer you, you bumped up a spot maybe yeah. i leveled up so to speak you're on deck now yes man that is awesome i didn't know if huh. you knew that or no not, i so. didn't yeah so this they they are credited with creating the modern day growler where'd they find the old bucket and how'd they know that's what it was they i, I don't know it didn't say hmm. you would think it'd have more it was just like a little paragraph about it like that's kind of a big deal i would think because i was there mm-hmm. in their tap room yep and if i had that original thing i'd have it just like Indiana Jones did with the statue, I'd have it on a little pillar. I'd have a light on it. I'd yeah. have a story about it. I'd have laser lights around it so no one could steal it. Mm-hmm. It would be the focal point of my brewery if I had this uh, exquisite antique. Yes, and I don't remember that. Right, but that- maybe they're just you know they're doing business different than I would do. Maybe. But that's something to be proud of, though. Maybe it's locked up in a in a like a mm. safe or something. Like in Indiana Jones, it's it's in a vault somewhere yeah. or something. So. Yeah, you got to have the code, and you got to get through the like snakes. A, lots and lots of snakes. Snake River yeah. is right there. Oh, good. That's a good segue right there. I try. Nice work. Oh yeah. So on the, if you go to their website, if you go to to you look at the history, they show you the pail. The first pail, right? The lidded pail that they found. And then their first growler, their first glass growler. And then they have like a modern day growler, which is just like theirs. Stainless steel stainless or something. Steel one. Yeah, that's what yep. most people are going to now, yeah. Yep. 
Uh, in the spring of 1998, they broke ground on a new brewery at the base of uh, Teton Pass in Victor, Idaho. In 2000, they changed their name to Grand Teton Brewing. Brewing, And in April of 2009, uh, the, it only said Charlie, so I wonder if Ernie passed away. Uh, but in 2009, they sold, Charlie sold to Steve and Ellen Furbacher. And they have since expanded the brewery considerably, adding bottling lines and all kinds of fermenters and stuff. They're like 11,000 square feet now mm, total yeah. there. So, all right, the IPA settled down a little bit. Let's. Did you try it? Did you I give did. It a shot. Yep. It's, uh, hmm. it's an IPA. That was the face I was waiting for. Yeah. Hopefully, it was documented. Yeah. Uh, it's it's hoppy. Yes. Um, it has, at the beginning, it's almost malty flavored, like a malt, sort of almost like a Belgian style. So compared to some of the IPAs mm-hmm. we've done, uh, ABV 6.5, that's about right on track. Yeah. Now, here's here's where it's different. IBUs. IBUs. Where are we at? If you had to guess, what do you think? Oh, man. It, with the hoppy bitterness. Right that, with that one? Yes. Let me try it again. Let's see how close he can get, folks. We're going to get him to the next level here. I don't know. Of, of, I mean. Of beer nerddom. I mean, yeah. since it's new, like yeah. it's a new beer, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know if the recipe is new, but yeah. most places aren't going past 60 or 70 anymore for anything. Sure. So I would guess around 65. That would be my guess. You're super close. It's 70. Yeah. 70. I would have guessed in the 60s, too. I'm I would have guessed low 60s, though. And I'm almost not. No, I think that that's was, okay. that's a good guess. That means I've, you know, I've had a sample size or two. Maybe one or two. Yeah. Yeah. So... Okay, so as as we're working on the IPA here, what what uh, knowledge did you find for us this time? Well, I will start with the Teton National stuff, and then I have just a little bit about one of the other beer. I have a little bit about the other two beers, so okay. I'll, I'll kind of feed the facts of this stuff. Okay. Other than the fact that I've been there, and it's amazing, and it's beautiful. And you should definitely go there if you're passing through. Oh, yeah. Like, this is a destination stop. Yeah, it's not a it's not a passing through. It's a You've got to make a day or two of it, for okay. sure. Okay, okay. Um, it is one of the top 10 most visited national parks in America. Grand Teton National Park? Yes. Is that what it's called? Okay. It gets about 20, was it 2.5, I think? 2.5 million people per year mm. are checking it out. Wow. has 310,000 acres. Um, the, let's see here, highest mountain top is Grand Teton, right? So that's okay. where it gets the name from. Mm-hmm. And that is about, let's see. Oh, I wrote it somewhere, but it's it's really tall. Let's it's go really with that. I'm going to use that uh, scientific term. Where does it rank in like uh, in in other like? It's in, in the height. top ten mountains. Okay. In the United States, it's yep. the tallest of that range, but it's not taller than some of the ones in the Rockies or okay. out in the in the Northwest. Okay. Uh, let's see. It is ten miles directly south of Yellowstone National Park, so it's very close. Oh. And that's the reason I went there, because I was going to Yellowstone, and we had a few days in Jackson, Wyoming. Okay. And we found our way here. Well, Jackson's directly south, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's right on the border of Wyoming and Idaho, mm-hmm. which is basically where this brewery is as well. Uh, it was first, let's see here, first found, discovered, visited, seen by a white guy in the 1840s. Okay. So it had had uh, Shoshone Indians in that area for... Um, thousands of years, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, uh, let's see, Lewis and Clark expedition was way north. It was up through Yellowstone and even north of Yellowstone. They went up almost to Canada and then arced over into, into Washington, Oregon. And then on the way back from the Pacific Ocean, they let one of their guys, um, his name was John Coulter. They're like, hey, you want to go, go a little bit south and see what you see down there? So he joined up with two French fur traders, and those were the first people uh, that were not native to this country to actually check out this area. Okay. Uh, and then he met up with Lewis and Clark again, gave them maps and surveys and that sort of stuff, and uh, that's where the, most of the information came from at that beginning part. Okay. Uh, let's see. It was named by these fur traders in the 1840s because that's who came back basically to there was to get uh, beaver pelts. Um, they named this area the, I can't speak French. Are you ready for this? Yep. Les Trois Titans. It's not bad, actually. You know what that means? The Grand Tetons? The Three Teats. Ah. Because it's three 
big peaked mountains right in a row there. So clearly so, he had something else on his mind as he was... Uh, it was two fur traders, man, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> you know? <laughs> they, had to, they had to find stuff like that. All right. I liked Dolan's answer, though. That was, it was, was good. Close. It was a good try. Sure. Uh, it is uh, the, the peak of that mountain, 13,775 feet. Is how high it is. Thirteen. Oh, okay. So it's pretty. It's pretty tall. That's really yeah. Uh, um, because of that, and because of the area, around eighteen sixty to eighteen eighty, there was a big rush, um, like gold mining. You mm-hmm. know, like it was happening out west. Uh, well, they decided like in the mountains here, there are mountains. There's got to be gold and there's got to be minerals. Well, guess what? There's none. There's nothing there. And other people already kind of knew that. Okay. But it didn't stop people from going to the area because they just had to. Like, everybody was doing that. Going west, expansion, all that sort of thing. Yep. So that was really the only people there uh, from the 60s to the 80s and 1880s. And then they left because there was nothing there. There was no – there was nothing of value for them. Um, Some people stuck around and became – um, this John Coulter guy was there again from the Lewis and Clark expedition. He became what they called a mountain man, a guide, that okay. sort of thing for other fur trappers and things like that. Okay. Um, another thing that they did between, it was like a little bit after 1900, maybe a little before, uh, mountaineering became something that people did. So climbing mountains just because. Okay. So like a, like a sport we know today. Sure. You yeah, know, yeah. Uh, there's some people that even work here that mountain climb or climb, mm-hmm. you know, like in gyms and stuff, they do this. Yep. Uh, and it was a lot different back then. So basically you'd have like a guy with a rope and he would hammer into the cliff and climb up and then he would keep that rope and then somebody else would come up with him and like, you know, they didn't have the the clothes, the equipment that right. people have now. It would be like if you and me went out in our office clothes, mm-hmm. if we were dressed up and, mm-hmm. you know, our slacks. Sure. And we just decided to climb up the top of a mountain. That was basically mountaineering back then. That, that, that doesn't sound safe it or wasn't. fun. I don't all. know. It might be fun, but it wouldn't be safe for <sighs> sure. I don't know. So people did that. And that's still a thing that people do there today. Um, there's 800 routes to the peak of the mountain. So it's one of the most mapped out, uh, I guess they call it runs. Sure. It's kind of like skiing. Okay. So you're just going to the top and there's 800 different ways to, to get to the top of that mountain. All right. Which is, I th- that seems to me like a lot. That's a lot. Uh, let's Could see. you hike there in a, like, is it a day? Does it take a couple days? I would think it would take you a few days. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, they did find... In the 1880s, they found the remnants of a man-made structure about 500 feet below the peak, and they felt it was probably from Native Americans had mm-hmm. built out some sort of um, basically a place to stop and mm-hmm. camp, stay. They don't know if it was for religious reasons or whatever that they sure. would go up to the top of the mountain or whatever, but they found some sort of man-made structure that mm-hmm. was there. A base camp kind of place or whatever, maybe? Yeah, or, okay. and they call it the enclosure. And I think parts of it are still there. There's like some ruins of it still there. They couldn't come up with a better name than that. That's... I mean, this is the 1880s they're okay. talking about. All right. They didn't have Google or anything like that. <laughs> there wasn't Google? No. If there was, it was just some dude's name. Yeah. Uh, Calvin Coolidge became the president who decided this should be a national park, February 26, 1929. Um, let's see. Some of the things that are in this place. Um, 1,000 varieties of plants. There are 61 mammals, uh, one of which is a wolverine. Oh. So you can, you probably wouldn't be able to see one because they're mm-hmm. very hard to find. Mm-hmm. They also have grizzly bears there and black bears. There are 300 kinds of birds, 12 types of fish, four kinds of reptiles, none of which are poisonous. There's three snakes. They're mostly just garter snakes, okay. which I could deal with. Let's be honest. I don't think you want to run into a wolverine. In a wolverine, no. um, a grizzly bear, no. a brown bear, no. even an angry squirrel. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to mess with any like uh, possums. Possums oh, yeah. are mean. Raccoons. Raccoons. Yeah, see, I saw the uh, fear in your eye. Yes, when we said that, we yep. joined up on that one. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's lots to do there. Basically, there's lots of animals. There's a ton, a literal ton of elk. Oh, of course. So the National Elk Refuge mm-hmm. is. In this area. Oh. So it's in between where they are in the summertime at Yellowstone, mm-hmm. and in the wintertime, they have to go right through Teton National Park. Okay. And you will see thousands and thousands of, of elk. Of elk. And it's the only national park, I learned this today, it's the only national park that allows hunting. And it's specifically elk, because there are so many. Oh. They have to try to keep them down. My wife would not be happy with that. 
Most people wouldn't be happy with that, no. at least in a national park situation. But and you that's have why to, there's only one. You have to thin the herd, though. You have you do. to. I mean, the Yellowstone, I saw something in the paper the other day that they were going to send 800 bison off mm-hmm. for uh, harvesting. We'll call it harvesting. Harvesting. That yes. sounds less terrible. Have you had bison before, like the burger, like the ground beef? Yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. It's delicious. It's very lean. Yes. There's a bison burger place just down the road. That's right. Yeah. Right next to uh, Duluth Trading Company. That's a... Hmm. Hunting and trapping and yes. buffalo burger. Fortunate placement for it. So, long story short, it's an amazing place in America. It's be, it's one of those places that you can go to and see what things actually look like 150 years ago, 200 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. It has not changed. And it's protected for that reason. And it's, it's beautiful. And it's my favorite. Probably. I haven't been to Yosemite, but it's my favorite national park. As of now. Really? Okay. Yeah. Even more than Yellowstone, for sure, for me. Wow, that's cool. There's lakes in the middle that you can take really cool tours with. There's like 200 miles of hiking around the area. Yep. Um, A lot of it, which has been um, made so that people with disabilities can go and enjoy the the trails, uh, which also means it's good for people like me who hate exercise. Right. Uh, It's not a lot of like, you know, sheer cliff climbing. It's Mm. more like there's a few steps. I, 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 I do some hiking myself, and I am not very athletic whatsoever, so I like it's more of a leisurely walk. Sure. It's but a stroll I still, in the nature. But I like to do it. And it kind of tricks you into going like, oh, it's only 1.5 miles there, and then 1.5 mm-hmm. miles back. And you're like, 1.5, that doesn't seem like much, yeah. or whatever. And then usually I'm hyperventilating by the end of it. It's, it's bad. Well, and if you do that here, you might have to run away from a wolverine or a grizzly bear. So just keep that in mind. Well, okay. As long as there's a trip to the brewery afterwards. So for sure. Be okay. They sell this beer, I know for sure in Yellowstone, at some of the places that you can stop and get supplies. I don't know really? if they sell it in Grand Teton, but I know for sure in Yellowstone, I have bought in Grand Teton Brewing Beer. Interesting. I brought it home. Hmm. This is my, I think I might have shared this with you before, is so my wife likes to hike, and then my son likes to as well. Um, look at animals, that type of thing. Not super like like mountain climbing, mm-hmm. hiking, but you know, decent hikes yeah. or whatever. So that's how she tricks me into hiking. Is then she promises that we can go to the brewery afterwards. That's the carrot on the stick. Absolutely, that would work for me. Yep. Hmm. Yep. Yep. She's tricked me into some really long hikes before. <laughs> no, I swear it's just over the, no, over it's, the hill. It's, it's not very far. We're, We're almost there. Whatever. Okay. All right. So let's. Uh, you want to do the, the session? Yeah. Let's next? do that one. So I'm, I'm super curious about what a session is. I don't know if I've ever had. You have. I have. Okay. Yeah, and it's right. it's uh, it sounds like it's going to be something really cool, and it's and really it's not. And you're going to just guess what it is, but it's basically something that's under five percent, right? This one is a session ale because it's not an IPA. Usually, you'll hear the term session IPA. So that's an IPA that is brewed to taste like an IPA. Holy foamy! Look at I that told thing. you. Wow. Uh, we're gonna have to let that sit down for. Did a I run with them up here? I don't know I don't why they're so have. foamy. Maybe you did a hike. I guess. Um, so it's gonna be less than five percent. Five point two, I think, is the standard cutoff, and this is four point seven percent. Okay. Okay. The IBUs on this one are sixteen, so very um, low. There won't be any like hot bitterness from this beer. Uh, it's supposed to just be a session beer. Is basically drinkable all day beer. So it, it kind of started. Um, like everything great with beer over in Europe and Germany and stuff. Mm-hmm. And they would brew the beers or have them basically grow. You know, they didn't weren't really doing any work to them. Um, but they wanted them to be low so that the people that were working on the farms and in the, the vineyards and that sort of thing weren't mm-hmm. getting hammered. Sure. They needed to have something to drink during the day. And that's where the term really kind of comes from. So it's some, anything you can see, um, the term session will mean it's less than 5%. It can apply to... I, this is the first time I've ever actually seen one that wasn't an IPA. Usually you just see session IPAs because that mm-hmm. one we just drank was 6.7. Right. So this is already two and a half or two less than that. Right. Um, and usually there's like Founders All Day IPA mm-hmm. is a session IPA. Um, Ooh, really? Yep. It's all Day IPA is a session. That's, that's why it's called All Day. Because you can drink it all day. It's a session IPA. Arguably, and we've had this conversation, yeah. arguably one of the best IPAs in the market. Right. Canned yeah. IPAs. For sure. Yes. Um, most big craft breweries will have a session IPA. I know Boulevard has one. Um, New Belgium has one. Okay. Um, Founders has that one. I mean, they're they're like around a lot. I know Cross Train has made one before. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it's just a thing that basically, especially in the summertime, um, people can, you know, drink a couple beers and not be super buzzed. I'll be interesting to get your, I'm interested in your take on this because there's a sweetness to it. It smells biscuity. That, uh, yeah, there's, it's a, how do you want to, how do I want to say it? Like a croissant yeah. Ish flavor, maybe? It's got a Belgian y flavor, which is sweetness to me. It mm-hmm. almost tastes like honey. A little bit. Um, this beer specifically, all it's kind of like there was one that was made at by Boiler Brewing Company that was all Nebraska ingredients. Mm-hmm. This one is everything is from Idaho. So That's, every bit of that is Idaho yeah. based. Okay. So Idaho water, the mm-hmm. um, two row malt, the grain bill, um, the hops. There's two different kinds of hops in this beer. Everything in this beer is from Idaho. And that's why it's called 208, because that's the area code for the entire state. The whole state has one. Yeah. So you're saying, you're saying, and that's based on population, correct? Mm-hmm. So the population of Nebraska yeah. is more than the population of Idaho. I don't know. I'm, that's what it says here. I mean, because we have three area codes now. Yeah. We're we moving do. on up. I mean, what's the population of Nebraska right now? You think? I have no idea. It used to be always like 2.5 million. It's Omaha and then everybody else. And Lincoln, yeah. Sorry, everybody else. I'm going to guess we're at 3.5 million. That's my guess. You I might don't be know. right. Dolan's going to look true. it up. He's going to ask the Google machine how much uh but Yeah, so that's why, that's why this is called 208. And uh, I don't mind it. It's One, sweet. What do you say? 1.92 million. Is in Idaho? In Idaho? No, Nebraska. Hmm. As of... 2017, a little outdated. Okay, look up look up Idaho then. Let's see what's that the That seems really of low. Idaho. I always thought Omaha had a million. I thought so too. I thought Omaha. Well, if you think about it, Omaha and surrounding could be a million, and yeah. then the point nine two could be Lincoln and everything else. Maybe. Well, Lincoln's yeah, Lincoln's only. Lincoln's got to be like four hundred thousand by now. Oh, yeah. With college, with with the university in in session, Lincoln is totally growing. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they still have what they got now, like five hospitals that are down there. Yeah. Uh, Heart Hospital specifically is another new one that's there. Every time I go to Lincoln, uh, mostly to go to these breweries, Mm -hmm. everything's different. They're building apartments and houses like crazy. True. So Idaho, 1.75 million. All right, we beat them. So just barely. All right. Take that, Idaho. All right. So yeah, that's, that's what the session is. Okay. And you'll yeah, they, see that term, especially it's towards spring as we're getting here closer. We'll start seeing those on the shelves again, mm-hmm. session IPAs. But this is the first time I've ever seen a session ale. A session ale. Yeah, I like that. I think mm-hmm. that's pretty good. There is there is a biscuity sort of sweetness, honey e. Yeah, it's like a honey, to it. almost like a honey saison. Mm-hmm. But the foam is something that's problematic. I know. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So give me, give me besides like all day IPA. Mm-hmm. Give me, give me another. Uh, something similar. It doesn't have to be a session. Like, give me something for somebody who's like, I don't know if I'd want to drink this, but I drink this now. This beer right here, what we're having? Yes. Uh, Flavor profile see. wise. Taste a little bit more. So I, I this is purely for research mm-hmm. and to answer your question because I I would never indulge again this I, quickly. If I had to, if I had to, something recently, something that mm-hmm. we have drank recently. It's a Miller High Life sort of. Yeah, it has that sweetness, I guess. Right. And it does kind of have that bready, biscuity sort of uh, flavor. Mm-hmm. Let me take another a little, A little bit different, but still still in there with that. It's like it has a Saison yeast, which gives it these really tiny bubbles that we're seeing. Um, mm-hmm. If you gave that into the Miller High Life, okay. then I think that's pretty close to what this would be. There you go. Which is just an ale. I yeah. mean, that's all it is, you know. So mm-hmm. um, very accessible. Like, there's no hop. Mm-mm. bitterness or anything like that these definitely could go down if if i think this is probably um an issue of maybe born on date maybe storage maybe mm-hmm. transportation but Tran- if we were yeah. getting a six pack of this fresh off the line mm-hmm. i bet you this would be very crushable in yes. the summertime yes. for sure now for all of you non-beer nerds out there yeah crushable Uh-oh. is an industry term it is for lots of for beers that you can drink a lot of yeah yes Yep, more than one. Yes, my friend Scott says that a lot. Crush, very crushable. Well, he makes very crushable beers. Yes, he does. Yeah. Yes. Cross strain is, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, well, fairy nectar is not very crushable, right? That's not. Uh, it, it, the problem is it is crushable. Mm. It's just the end result is not great. No, right. It's very easy to crush them. Mm. It's just then you get crushed after a few. Yes. That's how that works. Yeah. So it's uh, just a matter of what you're looking for with, with your day. You want productivity? Mm-hmm. Try a session ale. 
If so, you don't, then then you don't have to. Four point seven is. I mean, that's that's close to. You, that's less than a Bud Light. Yes, Bud Light's like five two, and I, Coors Light's like four eight or eight four nine somewhere in there. I would rather have this. I would rather have that too, and I and I enjoy I enjoy a nice Coors Light. So and the problem is we can't we can't get this. The closest we can we got to go to Wyoming. They can get it there. It was in. I saw their distribution. It was pretty much surrounding us, and then there's a couple of states to the east of us that get it, but mostly it's out west. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you look on their website, it gives you a kind of a distribution map, and we're nowhere close to it necessarily. Okay, so we'll go into the last one now. Grapefruit Goza. This is more my style. I like, as everybody knows, I like the sour. Um, you right there? Yeah. Just trying to finish that foam. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there was something because look at this one. Look at when would a Goza ever do that? No, I it's, think it was. I think it was you hustling up here. That's probably what it was. I want to stay agitating ahead. it. I want to stay ahead of schedule today. Well, we're doing it, man. Okay. All right. So, all right. Go. Here's some here's some uh, stuff that I re researched or will refresh. Mm-hmm. This is the one that seems super familiar. Dolan, why does this seem? So I think familiar? we did this maybe, or we at least talked about did it, didn't we? we, Dolan? I don't know. Didn't we? I think we did, Dolan. Uh, but here we go. So a Goza is a sour wheat beer. That's basically where it starts, yep. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it Also, what makes it a Goza is it has to have salt, preferably sea salt, mm-hmm. and it has coriander. Where, it, where in the brewing process does this take place? This is after the beer has been basically, after brewing, like, okay, it's basically an addition to the beer. Right, so you you brew your normal wheat beer, okay. let's say, and then when that's done, um, before fermentation, you're adding lactobacillus basically to this, basically spoiling it after you've made a good beer. You then go ahead and spoil it on purpose. Okay, is basically how that works. I'd love to have been the first person that it, like like oh shit, we screwed this one up. We uh oh, we done did it. Well, and you'd have to have done that in the 1200s. Rich, because that's when this beer style came oh, around. Oh, okay. And it was more. It was more like they let. Um, I guess I don't. Want to, I don't want to say nature, but they let um, things happen to the beer on purpose. There, so like um, saisons, for instance, uh, like in France and especially um, Germany, they would brew them in big batches and just leave them open, open tanks. Okay. And stuff that would blow in from the air would just land in there. Bugs. Bugs, for sticks, sure. Okay. Sticks, but also like pollens and oh. uh, bacteria basically would form in these things. And that's what would give um, those beers a regional flavor. So they did that on purpose. Mm. And that's kind of the same thing with this. They would let it be infected on purpose. When they would make these beers, and they probably still do this kind of today with just different technology, they would brew up the beer, they would get it ready. Um, they wouldn't cork it when they would put it in like a big barrel or whatever. Mm-hmm. Usually you would close it up, right? Okay. So they leave it open so that because the yeast is doing this thing and it's, it's going crazy, it's foaming as it's making, it's putting out gas. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't want to trap that in there. So they're leaving it open so that basically air can come both ways, in and out. Okay. And that's, that's really the difference of this style of beer. Okay. Um, so it was brewed in the 1200s. The town was, I'm going to say, Gosler, Germany. Okay. There's a Goza River in that area. Mm-hmm. It was the only place, really, that this beer was made. Um, there was a, a town that was close that started also making it around that time, uh, and it was very popular for those areas, and they started to send it all around Germany. This beer style, not this specific one, but the style of beer, uh, I don't know that we've talked about this before, but... Oh, that's a that is a German word with a lot of letters in it. Let me try to pronounce it here. The Go for it. Reinheitsgebot. Mm. Reinheitsgebot. Mm. That is the basically the German law. And Sp- and, uh, and Mr. Mike Spees could tell us about this. We were yes. talking about it the other day. Yeah. There is a way that you have to make beer for it to be considered a German beer. It has like basically four ingredients. The ingredients that you make beer and anything that you add to that, it it basically makes it illegal. So this beer was an illegal. German beer, and they had to basically make, make an exclusion for it and be like, mm, okay, it doesn't meet our standards as a German beer, oh. but you're brewing it, and we love it, so we'll go ahead and let it, we'll let it slide. Even it's like though an it asterisk. happens after the fact. Yes, yeah, because you're adding stuff to the beer. Oh, I see. So you're adding ingredients mm-hmm. that aren't tes- necessarily needed to make a beer. Gotcha. So that's how it works. Basically, um, 
we talked about adjunct mm-hmm. back when we were doing stouts, so yes. we can consider this to be ad- adjunct. I would argue that that you could say this is needed to make a beer. This this is. Well, I, you that's because you like the style of beer. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I get you. I, yeah. get, I get what you're putting down. Mm-hmm. So some of the other breweries that are around here that make a Goza style mm-hmm. uh, is Perennial, which is in St. Louis. I don't know if you've ever had any of their stuff. I don't like St. Louis. I forgot you got Cub stuff on right now. That's right. That was my bad for picking that one, guys. Sorry. Good job. Ooh, felt the tension in the air. <laughs> uh, Sam Adams has one, which I did not know. It's called a Raspberry Lemon Goza. What? I've never seen it. No, you're making this no, up. No, I, I pulled this off the website. I thought for sure I've tried every Sam Adams beer. There's no way. I have a weird... Do they have like a hundred kinds of beer. Okay, well, the ones we can get. How's that? Yeah, well, then I don't think we can get this one, but no. they have one. It's 5.2%. Um, I, Deshtel has a blueberry goza. I, I, I love that one. That one's really good yes. out of normal Illinois. Illinois. And Boulevard has that hibiscus goza. Which was the very first goza I ever had at Steve Steitner's house. Mm. In, so we can blame him for this. In the early days of me drinking beer, where I would still just be like, "No, I don't. I'm, I'm not going to drink that. That's right. That, no, that tastes like pee. I don't want it. I, oh. I don't want that. Yeah, right. Because um, well, that's what I thought. I was just super uneducated. So in, what were in you all of this. choosing then instead? I liked I liked uh, ciders a lot. Okay. Uh, I liked vodka. I still yeah. like vodka. Yeah, that's a lot still, of the world does. Yeah. Yes. So, but uh, that I would choose one of those two things. If it was like some sort of an event, I would take ciders. If it was some sort of like just hang out, then I would bring like a good vodka and a mixer okay. type of thing. Wow. Yeah. Um, in Lincoln, have you been to Sorrow? I don't know if it's a cidery. No. But there's a, there's a place in Lincoln that just makes ciders and they make uh-huh. some bomb ciders. And there's also a couple of uh, local wineries that make them. I know Glacial Till has like yep. four or five really good ones. They, had a, they did a barrel aged one that was amazing. Yes. Ooh, that was super good. Um, so this weekend, I was this past weekend, I went. To, my daughter is working at local. Oh, okay. uh, here in Omaha, local is uh, is a place that only serves local beer and then really good food mm-hmm. too. So Oma, Omaha, Lincoln, some Iowa. Um, yeah, there's beers. a couple Iowa beers. Yep. Yeah, and then uh, throughout Nebraska too, the Kincaider and, and places like that, they they serve that as well. Uh, but no, you can't get Bud Light or anything like that right. there. Um, but they had two from Glacial Till. One was the uh, the barrel aged, which was really good. They also mm-hmm. had a dry hopped one. Oh, weird! Which I thought was super weird. Did it taste good? It did. Hmm. Yeah, it was sweet, but then it had the weird like kind of hoppiness, but not bitter. Just not bitter. Tasted hoppy, but just tasted hoppy. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. Of course, my wife did not like. I that. mean, that's how She's, that's how no. like Cross Trade makes all their IPAs. It's dry hopped. Dry hopped, like, and that's what most people are doing. That's how you get those hoppy. Uh, taste without the bitterness of the IBU. Mm-hmm. So that's how that's done. Yeah. Um, because this has coriander in it, I did a little coriander research. Okay. It's one of the few things that can be a spice and, I'm going to try to say this right, an herb. H E R B oh. herb. Mm. The way mm-hmm. that you use it and prepare it, it can be either one. Really? Uh, what it is, which I did not know, and maybe. Um, maybe Dolan did with his cooking background. Possibly. Um, it is. Um, basically dried cilantro seeds is what coriander is. No kidding. So when you plant it and you grow it up and you use the leaves, that's cilantro. Mm-hmm. And, and if you get it before that and you roast them, then that is coriander. Oh. And you grind up coriander seeds and you can use that in curries. And also a lot of times people use it for um, savory baking, like biscuits and rolls and that sort of stuff, breads. Mm. You'll see it in that quite a bit. Pho. Pho. It's a main ingredient. Oh, he's saying pho. Pho. I thought he was just cursing. I thought so too, and he just didn't finish it off. It Weird. was like he was like speaking in cursive for yeah. a second, but uh, he's talking pho with a little line above the o, right? Okay, I'm picking up. I see. This is, the Filipino grandma's coming out in you right now. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, she knows how to make the fa fa. Um, let's see. It's a member of the parsley family. Okay. And here's something I didn't know, and this might be why some people are just averse to this. Because uh, some people don't like Goza style beers, right? Like right. instantly they're just like, well, not I think for me. Well, I think they're crazy, but that's fine. Okay. Most people taste like a lemon lime sort of flavor from coriander. Like you're going to get that from mm-hmm. that. Uh, four to fourteen percent of people will taste a soap flavor. That's the cilantro thing. Soapy thing, yeah. Yes. And that's just the thing. So instantly, you you might really want to love it, but right. you're just the way your tongue takes that flavor in. It tastes soapy or metallic to you, and you're just like, nope. 
instantly you're you're shot down with that. So without knowing this, we should have Karen Andreessen come in here and try this. Why does she? Because not? she's one of the people that she tastes soap with with cilantro. Really? Yes. Hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that was even a thing. That's a thing. It's it's almost it's a genetic thing. She told me like it's hmm. either, you're either one way or the other. It's a genetic thing. Wow. How did I wonder? Hmm. hmm. I was gonna wonder how she learned that, but I guess I just know. over time. Maybe it's because she doesn't like. She doesn't like cilantro. So like in salsa or Italian seasoning on your pizza or nothing like that, huh? Mm-mm. Okay. Not one bit. But that's what I learned about coriander. Interesting. It's been around for a long time. It's one of the oldest spices. It was mentioned in the Bible. They found um, record of it from 5000 BC in some ruins. Really? You know, they do like basically um, archaeological horticulture, and they can mm-hmm. tell like what people cooked and ate back in the day. And that was something that they found even coriander. way, way, way back then. Yep. Hmm. So it's gold, frankincense, myrrh, coriander, coriander. seeds. Yeah, cilantro seeds. Okay. Yeah. And maybe they were making beer with it. Who knows? Yeah. They were smart because this is delicious. This one is, is probably the best of the bunch for me. Mm-hmm. I did really, really, really like this 208. I wanted to call it 408, but a 208. I would say that, yeah, the session is a, is a second for me, and then the yeah. IPA. Their IPA was pretty... I mean, that's a you're, a, you're a new school IPA guy. Yes, I am. I think we're learning this as we go. Yes. And I'm a all school IPA guy. Yes. So I'm okay with those bitter, hoppy, pine coney mm-hmm. sort of beers. I like those chewy ones even. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you are more like the fruity, not hoppy, but hop mm-hmm. flavored stuff. Hop flavored East Coast IPA. Hazy. It's basically as your hazy Hazy, hazy IPA as guy. possible. Yeah. It needs to look like orange juice. Man, I wish you could have been with me in Charlotte and had Man. that beer. I wish I would have been there. That'd oh, been bummer. Awesome. Man, maybe next time. Yeah, all right. So uh, the brewery itself, open daily, 11 to 9 p.m. Kids are welcome, but they need to be accompanied by an adult, and they're very specific about that on there. So Does it matter who's adult? Well, it doesn't say. It just says just an, an adult. adult. Cool. So it doesn't really matter. Nice. <laughs> it also says that dogs are welcome, but they got to be on a leash. So With an adult. With an adult. Or the kid, maybe. Who knows? You they can strap the dog to the kid and then hold the kid's hand. And if and the then, dog's old like mine, maybe yeah. that counts as an adult. I, I don't know. I'm just I'm well, just trying to get him a couple more bucks. It might. Okay. It might. It might. Uh, they do not have food options, but they have food trucks, and they're very clear about saying you're very welcome to bring your own food. So, like when I was there, it was very nothing else around it. So mm. uh, maybe it's changed since then because it's been a few years, but. There wouldn't. You'd have to definitely plan ahead to bring food to this place, from what I remember. Oh, you had wow. to drive over the mountain pass oh, from okay. Wyoming into Idaho to get to the place. So, like, if there's bad weather or anything, mm-hmm. you're going to have to stay at the brewery and drink a lot of beer. I don't see a problem with this. No, I, no. I would hope for snow. The next time I'm visiting my friend Harrison Ford in, uh, oh, in Jackson, Wyoming, right. oh. maybe I'll make an extra trip over there. Let me pick up that name you just dropped. Right. So, Harrison you know, Ford. Her in, wow. Him and uh, Callista. Yep, they're still know. together, man. That is. 20 years now. Has she been on anything on TV? Anything? It doesn't matter. She's so rich. It doesn't matter. I guess so. She still needs to eat a sandwich, I bet, because... Maybe. A you, vegan sandwich, probably. Jamie, has she been on anything on TV? Do you know? Has she been... Nothing? No. Jamie's like, who the heck is Callista Flockhart? Yeah. There we go. Allie McBeal. No. What? That's okay. No, oh, okay. no, I didn't either. I don't think anybody watched Allie McBeal. Well, so it was... Kind Besides of the dancing baby thing, yeah. that was pretty that was much the it. First viral meme, by the way. Dancing baby was the first viral meme. It looks like it too. It's it has not held the time. No, it's not pretty at all. low quality resolution mm. on that baby. You guys can make something better in like five minutes. Interesting. Than that. Yeah, probably. So, all right. So if we had to choose, it goes Goza Session IPA. Yeah. Yeah. For for us right now, yes. Mm-hmm. For us right now. So. Now, if we were at the brewery drinking these right off the tap, maybe mm-hmm. it would change the ratings. But that's as true. as we stand in this uh, beautiful conference room, mm-hmm. that's where we're at. All right. So I want to thank Taylor Christensen, uh, client manager for Atlas, for bringing these to us again. This is uh, pretty awesome. Twice now he's brought them to us. The first time, I don't remember why he had to or why he had to bring them again. I don't remember. That's weird. Luckily, he had he had a way to get us these beers. Luckily. Yeah. Yes. So... All right, next week, uh, what are we doing next week? Is it a choose-your-own-adventure? It might be. Better than the Amazon mm. choose-your-own-adventure. I think it'll maybe it'll be something from my uh, collection. Oh. I'm going to try to hit a style we haven't done yet. The Brian Surprise yeah, we'll next week. Yeah, dig through. Uh, I, might need a, I might need Dolan to help me sort through what I've got, but we'll bring something in we haven't had. Do you before. really want to invite him over to 
that's like the Tasmanian devil. Well, you know what I would I would say is I don't really want him to, but maybe my wife would mm. to make a little space. Maybe Dolan could come over and help me uh, lighten the load. I could put a dent in your collection. I I think he could All with right. Grandma's foe. Right. We'll, we'll we'll fill you guys in next week on on how that goes. We'll see you next week. <laughs>